This was the largest LEGO Harry Potter set in 2018, and it's still the largest LEGO Harry Potter set four years later. With 6,020 pieces, the set is instantly recognizable, but doesn't even come close to capturing the entire Hogwarts castle. In fact, even the Hogwarts castle in Universal Studios only shows this portion of the castle, which means there's no way that it could be minifigure scale. So to capitalize on all the architectural detail, the designers chose to go micro scale, and this set includes 27 of these trophy figures, five Dementors, and four exclusive minifigures. With the retail price of now 470 US dollars, you may be wondering if this set is worth it. So keep watching to find out if this set is for you. Oh, and we're in the wizarding world now, so if you could all just swish and flick that like button, that'd be much appreciated. Ready on three now, one, two, three, swish and flick. Do it, do it now. Now we can begin our journey. Inside this magical box are four pretty ordinary instruction manuals. So you can technically have two people building this set as there's two separate wings. Book one and two cover the first section and book three and four cover the whole other side. The build starts out much like Harry's first year journey into these five small boats, which are really just comprised of a few pieces but look quite compelling. And they lead you straight into the boathouse. Even though the boathouse can't actually accommodate any of these boats, it still looks the part. The stairs up to the castle also aren't exactly stairs, but it works. And I do really love the look of the courtyard with all of the sloped off edges and the new window pieces with the window panes inside. They even included the caretaker's quarters. The courtyard of course leads straight into the great hall, which is probably my favorite section of the entire castle as it's the most iconic. Just above the entrance is the grand clock and to the left of the entrance is the statue of the founder. There's room all the way around the exterior of the great hall, kind of like a walkway lit by torches and the details on the outside are just phenomenal. Inside, there's a banner and table for each of the four houses, and of course, the headmaster and professor's table. To set the tone, the Great Hall has these torches, and just looking through the stained glass from the inside also looks really good. And that's because of these two new elements that were created just for this set. I know they've since been used on other sets, but it's a half stud arch and the corner arch piece, which can fit a grate underneath, which looks fabulous in architectural pieces like this. Getting into some movie reference, there are five Dementors flying overhead referencing the third movie, The Prisoner of Azkaban. And fun fact, these pieces are a recoloration of the Emperor Palpatine hologram. A surprise, to be sure. Also from the fifth movie, The Order of the Phoenix, we have all the decrees put into place by the terrible Dolores Umbridge, here represented by this sticker. And her micro figure is also included so that it can be placed in her office, which is so iconically plastered in pink and decorated with kittens, which I believe are represented by those studs on the walls. Those are supposed to be the printed plates that she hangs up. As much as I hate this character, I'm glad they included events from the fifth movie slash book into the castle, and it looks good. Following along Harry's journey chronologically takes us up the moving staircase to the third floor corridor, where they stumble upon Fluffy guarding a trap door to the Sorcerer's Stone. In order to get there, you have to pull the set apart, and there you'll find the Devil's Snare, and then the room with the keys, which are actually just stickers placed onto a one x two translucent tile, and it uses a paintbrush as a broomstick. I love that detail. In the next room is of course the wizarding chessboard that leads- Not me. Not Hermione. Harry into the final room, which contains the mirror of Erised and the Sorcerer's Stone. Unfortunately, the set doesn't include Coral, but you know, he kind of like turns into Ash anyways, so I think this is a proper representation of just that. On to the second year, Harry and Ron make a grand entrance into the Whomping Willow, a simple yet elegant build that can spin and articulate. <laughs> There's even an entrance to the tunnel leading to the Shrieking Shack. The Ford Anglia here is made up of just four simple pieces, and this is quite possibly my favorite micro build. Speaking of micro builds, we also have Hagrid's hut represented here, complete with orange studs for the pumpkins and a spider for Aragog. Although it is a little bit lighter than his actual color in the movie, I don't think there is a darker colored spider. The plates on Hagrid's hut are clipped to a spiderweb piece, which makes for another great micro build, and I don't have any complaints here. Back inside the halls next to the staircase, we find written on the corridor via a sticker. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air beware. Shortly after the scene, Harry has to go visit Dumbledore, and this golden griffin here is just that, the elevator leading up to his office. In his office, there are some stickers showing Fox on his perch. Over here, you can see the sword of Gryffindor, and there's also a bunch of photographs. I definitely don't know all the lore, so feel free to comment if you know who these people are. The main tower here has a really cool roof, using some brackets to hold on these plates at an angle. It also 
also makes it a bit curved around the bottom, which is perfect because things in the wizarding world are never quite at a perfect angle. Stuck to the roof here is another micro build, which is the Hungarian Horntail from the fourth movie, Goblet of Fire. It's a really nice representation, and I like this a lot. The entire exterior of the tower uses a ton of snot pieces to really sculpt the detail in. It also adds windows and just looks fantastic. Now leaving Dumbledore's office, let's head over to the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, which is definitely based on the events of the second book with the Cornish Pixies on the loose, wrecking havoc, and about to drop that hanging skeleton. I like the magnifying glasses in this room, but I think the stickers are what help really sell it so that you can recognize what it is, as there's just not enough micro builds in here to represent different things in the classroom. Heading up the stairs to the bathroom here, later discovered to be the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets, you'll notice that Moaning Myrtle is on the right panel, pondering death probably as they make their Polyjuice potions, and also on the left side you can see the Golden Mermaid showing that this is indeed the Prefect's bathroom, where Myrtle gives Harry some advice about putting that golden egg in the water with him, which can be seen just there. Simple build for the sink, but actually looks the part pretty well. And of course you know where this sink leads you, down into the chamber below, except only Harry gets through to this door, which is actually just a sticker. The door doesn't move, but this is indeed the entrance to the chamber. And inside the chamber itself, we can see the basilisk coming out of the mouth of the statue. Now this is actually Nagini from the CMF series, and it's been recolored in sand green here for this set, which to my knowledge is exclusive. There's also blue tiles on the sides representing the water, you've got all the snake statues, and this black tile here is indeed Tom Riddle's diary. Also, if you look into the set, you can kind of see the dark depths below the castle on either side, which kind of makes it a little more ominous. But the actual face of the statue here, I don't know, it just kind of looks like a totem pole face or something. I think it needs angry eyebrows. For the remaining years at Hogwarts, let's head over to the Gryffindor common room, which has a huge fireplace and these comfy looking red chairs. Just across from that is the library. Granted, these are just representations because the common rooms are of course in the towers and not next to the library. But I do love the micro details here in the library, even more so, I love the stained glass in this hall. It's one thing to look at it from the outside, but it's another to have the doors open and just viewing it from this angle, being able to see all the way down that bridge, which we'll get to in just a bit. Both the outside and the inside of this wing are fabulous, and the builds for those towers are stunning. I like how there's height differentiation and some differences in the build, because otherwise the build would get quite repetitive. Down below in the dungeons is the potions classroom with lots of brick built potion shelves, which is wonderful to see. And this has to be a nod to the sixth movie, The Half-Blood Prince. For this room in particular, I feel like the stickers actually nicely complement the micro builds here. Whereas in this other side, I believe this is the room of requirement when it's just full of junk, piles and piles of junk. The black piece here is the vanishing cabinet, and the stickers just kind of feel somewhat random. I honestly wasn't sure what this was when I was first building it. I thought it was stuff that was actually like buried underneath the castle. But it's just more junk that's cluttered all over the place. So I don't really love this room as much. There's not as many like iconic pieces or, or references that I could identify. But you know, as always, let me know in the comments if you spot something that I didn't see. As for the exterior of the castle, the entire thing is built up on these big ugly rock pieces, which for some people I know could totally be a pain. Actually, it's quite tedious putting all of the slopes and cheese slopes on there, but I do think that it hides the actual rock piece very well. And it would just take so many more pieces to not use those big ugly rock pieces. The castle is kind of like the Star Wars Mall Size Lake Cantina in the way that it utilizes a lot of small pieces. And then there are a few impressive angles, which came in when you're attaching the bridge sections. The bridge sections are surprisingly simple builds, but look really good. And that's again using those frame pieces. It would have been cool to see some of the water below the bridge, but we do get some greenery. There's a simple conifer build with just three of these upside down grass pieces. And while they look good, I find myself knocking them off about every Every time I try to move the set, it does come apart in two separate wings, but still one of my fingers always seems to just knock one of these trees off. As for the four exclusive minifigures, Godric Gryffindor here has the sword, a wand, and one of these older cape pieces. He also has this big red beard. I like his torso print, specifically that jewel, which looks a lot like the jewels that are encrusted into the hilt of the sword, which we see in later Harry Potter sets. There's also a back torso print, but just one face print. Helga Hufflepuff totally stole Princess Leia's hair here, and it does look pretty good, so I think she's wearing it well. She also has a yellow dress with a ruffled neck and the Honey Badger logo on both the neck and her belt buckle. She has a continuous print on the back and two face prints, so I think this might be my favorite of the four, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a Hufflepuff. 
Salazar Slytherin has a double cape piece, which makes him look extra evil. The torso is well printed to make it look like he's wearing his PJs and his favorite drippy chain. I mean, really, he's just a grumpy old looking dude, and I think that's because no one would agree with his purest ideas. Lastly is Rowena Ravenclaw, who could clearly benefit from some anti-aging serum on those eye wrinkles. <laughs> and ends the diadem with the blue starry night gown. This is a beautiful figure, but don't be saying anything bad behind her back or she will get sassy with you. <laughs> As for all the micro figures, we've got Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, Draco Malfoy, Albus Dumbledore, Professor McGonagall, Severus Snape, Remus Lupin, Dolores Umbridge, Argus Filch, we have some Gryffindor students, Hufflepuff students, Slytherin students, and Ravenclaw students. Then there's also Voldemort, Bellatrix Lestrange. Also included into that count is the statue and the chess pieces, but I like how they went and used larger pieces for the Dementors. Overall, this set is massive and stunning and even more incredible to build. But do you have room for it? The set measures about two and a half feet wide, and you're gonna need about two feet of depth on your shelf. But fortunately, it does come apart in two main pieces, which helps make transporting it a little bit easier. For me, I'm gonna be moving it to my Harry Potter shelves, and I've been planning to place it on the top shelf here. I think you can really tell how enthusiastic the designers were when they worked on this set. In fact, Justin is a huge Harry Potter fan, and it just so happens to be that the piece count of the set was the exact same number as the very first Lego wizard set ever created. Six 6020. One downside of the set, however, is something that makes the set so great, which is all the details, but a lot of those details come in the form of stickers, of which there were over 70, I believe. But keep in mind, this is a huge set and will probably take you several build sessions to complete, so unless you're totally speed building, just ramrodding in one go, I don't think you have to apply all of those stickers at once. Also, due to the interior detail, less of the actual exterior architecture could be built, such as the hospital wing, the owlry, the quidditch pitch, or even the greenhouses. So. I guess that could be another deterrent from buying the set. But, you know, if you're a mock builder, you could decide whether or not you want to add on to the set. I am personally pretty happy with the way that it is, and I think you might be too. Now, is the set worth the money? It's got a great price per piece, it's an instant icon, and it does have four exclusive minifigures. So I think the hardest part will be choosing between this and the slew of other expensive LEGO sets that have been made since. Coming in at the second largest and second most expensive Harry Potter set is Diagon Alley, which I highly recommend as it's minifigure scale and modular, so you could add it to a city. There's also the $250 Hogwarts icon set, which is unlike anything else on my shelf and really makes a statement. And then of course, the collector's edition Hogwarts Express, which is $550, takes up the most space, is super iconic, and also has tons of minifigures. I'd say it's a pretty tough choice and it really depends if you enjoy minifigure scale sets or display sets more. And despite having a ton of large and expensive display sets myself here in my room, I chose to get Diagon alley even before this one, but I still haven't bought the train, if that gives you any idea how I rank this set. I'd say this is pretty much tied for number one as the best Lego Harry Potter sets that fans are going to enjoy. But be sure to let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below, and if you made it this far, go ahead and comment your favorite candy from the wizarding world. And as always guys, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Happy building.